Are you mentally healthy? How do you know? If you'd like to learn one way to assess your mental health, then keep watching. In this video, I'll talk about degrees of mental health, how to identify signs of mental health or illness, and steps that we can take to improve our overall psychological well-being. Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is David Listen. But my view of mental health is that it's experienced in degrees. I've broken it down into degrees of mental illness. More broadly speaking, the experience of suffering. One is severe. Second is moderate. Third is minimal. So with severe suffering, where our mind is very disordered, and chaotic, where we have lots of distracting thoughts, even disturbing thoughts, worries about the future, regrets about the past, being very much upset with the present. We'll also have turbulent emotions, possibly a lot of anger, or a lot of fear, or deep sadness. With this kind of disordered state of mind, our view of life, our view of ourself, is also confused. We don't feel we know ourselves. We don't feel we can understand other people or the world. Everything just may be very confusing and disturbing. Our body is most likely affected from this kind of severe suffering, where we may experience a lot of pain that's not necessarily due to any physiological damage or harm to the body. We may experience chronic pains, tension, or just a, an overall sense of discomfort in the body our body may develop physical ailments. With severe suffering, our daily functioning is probably impaired. We're probably not sleeping well. We're probably not eating well. Not eating or sleeping well could be that we're either sleeping too much or not much at all. We're eating too much or we're afraid to eat or we have no appetite. With our activity, whether this is work or play or leisure, our activity may be out of balance, where we're either working too much, trying to work all the time to avoid our suffering, or that we're playing too hard, maybe partying too hard, or trying to enjoy life so much that we're, we're really doing so to avoid suffering. And that puts our life out of balance. And it could also be that our hygiene is suffering. We may be so preoccupied that we forget about wash ourselves as often. We don't change our clothes. We don't care about our appearance. Or it could be the other extreme, where we care so much about our appearance and how we look and grooming ourselves that it interferes with, with our life and functioning. Relationships also suffer. In this kind of condition, it's very difficult to communicate with people. It's very difficult to understand people, whether it's with strangers or friends or people very close to us, our life partners. Our relationship will likely suffer. At this time, we may also have risky behavior. We may turn to drugs or alcohol or even food or absorbing so much media to try and forget our pain. That kind of behavior damages our body. We may harm ourselves intentionally and even think of suicide or plan a way to end our life. It could be because of anxiety, worrying about the future, or a constant fear of, of something bad that's going to happen in the future. It could be the other side of that, where it's depression, a deep sadness, or disappointment with life, with ourself, with the world, coming from a lot of negative thinking. It could be fears about things, phobias about bugs, or phobias about being in certain spaces, fears that interrupt the functioning of our life. So, for example, if we're afraid of using an elevator, but we work in a hotel, that's a serious impairment to our, our work situation. We could even experience very unrealistic thoughts, very confused thoughts about ourselves and the world that at that point, people would call us crazy, so to speak. So, for example, if I thought I was the president of the United States, or if I thought I was the leader of China, that would be unrealistic thinking. That would be a complete delusion, because I'm not. But a person may have these kinds of thoughts when they're severely disturbed and suffering so much 
that their mind starts to conjure up all of these ideas and may also experience hearing voices or seeing things that aren't there. Their perception of the world is very much distorted, which could be termed as psychosis. So there are other kinds of trauma and distress that a person may have experienced that leads to a state of very intense suffering and may severely affect how they function and live their day-to-day -day life. So what can we do in this kind of situation? Most importantly, if your life is in danger, if someone else's life is in danger, please call 911 or bring yourself to the hospital or bring your friend to the hospital. If there's time to consider the options, I think it's important to seek out professional help. Professionals in the mental health field, such as counselors, of which I'm a mental health counselor, there's different kinds of counselors like marriage counselors, uh, clinical social workers, psychologists, and psychiatrists do what's called psychotherapy, counseling. For certain situations, a person can benefit from some medication to help a person come to a more stable state. And for that, psychiatrists can offer medical help, medication. Psychologists can offer some medications, and even your primary care physician can provide some medications for psychological conditions. These professionals who engage in psychotherapy can help diagnose or can help you understand your suffering, come up with some way to treat it or deal with it, manage it, and also help you find different supports in your life. These professions are designed to help a person with severe suffering. It's counseling, psychotherapy, and even medication that can help us come back to a more baseline level of mental health. Now the risk level is lowered. There's no risk of danger to one's life, and now one is able to function better in day-to-day -day life. So now I'd like to talk about the second degree of moderate suffering. Moderate suffering refers to when our mind is fairly stable, but we still experience distractions, distracting thoughts. We may worry about things or regret things, and we still have emotional disturbances, but we can deal with it. It's just the typical experience of human suffering. In this kind of situation, we may be unsure about our life direction. We could use some help on clarifying what should we do with our lives? How do we live our lives? With this kind of moderate suffering, our body is probably not so much affected by it. We may have all different kinds of ailments and illnesses, which is totally normal. We may lose some sleep some nights, but we're still able to get good sleep overall. We may have problems with our diet, but it's not totally affected by our condition of mind. We're functioning well overall. We're working, we're able to get our rest and our leisure. Our relationships are probably fairly stable. We still have difficulties. It can be hard to communicate sometimes with our friends or our partners. We have things to work on, but our relationships are, are relatively stable. And our behavior is not risky where we may still do some stupid things and make mistakes, but we're not putting our life at risk. We're not putting our health or others' health or property at, at risk of being damaged or harmed. But we still may lack some motivation to make healthy changes. We may be stuck in some bad habits and we're not sure what to do. So for example, we may want to clean the house, but we can't find the motivation to get up and do it. So a lot of clutter may collect in our home, or a lot of clutter may collect on our computer. So what could we do to improve our mental health in this kind of situation with so-called moderate suffering? Well, a person could seek out a therapist. Psychotherapy can help a person organize their mind, understand themselves, and and then make better, healthier changes in their life. Coaches can help a person with this degree of suffering, where either a life coach, mindfulness coaches, there are even love coaches who help people with relationships, and even a personal trainer, 
someone designed to help you train your body can help in some ways with your mental health, developing determination, developing consistent healthy exercise habit is also a behavior that benefits our psychological well-being. Some people could benefit from seeking out a religion or a community based on spirituality. Religion and spirituality have their own paradigm of health and well-being, which focuses not only on a healthy lifestyle, but a moral or ethical lifestyle to help us make choices that minimize harm and that maximize well-being with our interpersonal relationships. Of course, religion not only have this moral compass or moral guideline, but it can help a person understand questions that are not talked about in the medical field, deeper questions that they have about themselves and the universe, existence, questions that may not be addressed in a clinical setting. We can also seek out friends, close friends, to have discussions, to talk about what we think, how we feel, to talk about our deeper experience of life, which may not be talked about in more casual settings like parties or just social gatherings. It can be very healing to have friends that we talk about our inner experience. And we can also just work on ourselves, by ourselves, educating ourselves about how to sleep better, how to eat better, how to have more healthy activity, exercise, how to be mindful, how to train our mind through mindfulness, and meditation. We can educate ourselves, we can read about these things, but we can also seek out professionals in each field to help us learn the right methods to improve the condition of our body and mind, reducing our suffering and increasing our experience of well-being. At some point, we may find ourselves in a condition of minimal suffering, where a person experiences that their mind is at peace, that they have minimal distracting thoughts, rarely have emotional disturbances, and they have a clear direction, sense of purpose in life. The health of their body may not be perfect by any means, but they're not affected by the health of their body. Even if they have a terminal illness, they won't fear death, or they won't worry about death. They're prepared for it. This person would function very well in daily life, with probably very little bad habits. They're probably able to sleep well, eat well, move and rest, have a good social life, and find purpose in their daily activities. Their routines are solid and healthy, and they, they experience a sense of well-being. Our relationships are stable. We're able to communicate well with others. We don't feel there's conflicts. Even if someone feels there's a conflict with us, they don't like us or they hate us, we're not affected by it. We understand that others may be suffering, and in some situations, we can't relieve their suffering to them. So we're not affected whether people like us or they don't like us. So this person with minimal suffering, their behavior is skillful, where they make wiser decisions in their life, decisions that not only are beneficial for themselves and their well-being, but beneficial for others. A person with minimal suffering is not self-centered, but they, they're concerned for others as well. So this is a kind of compassionate attitude. So what if we're experiencing this minimal suffering and a great deal of peace and well-being? Is it that there's nothing left to do? Are we perfectly and absolutely mentally healthy? Well, I think that's not the case. There's always a way that we can continue to refine our mind or to refine our character. Because isn't it true that even if we're experiencing minimal suffering, we may still have tendencies to crave things, we have temptations, we have desires that cause trouble, we have anger, some rigid views that lead to argument or even a sense of tension. For people who are ex experiencing very little suffering and a great deal of peace 
there's usually a confidence with that experience to where a person can even become arrogant and feel that they are better than others because they're more peaceful than others. And isn't that a problem? Isn't arrogance a kind of suffering? It's also possible that a person is deluded. They believe that there's something great, that there's someone perfect, and they're blind to their faults. They may be really unaware of their faults, unaware of their anger, their craving, their rigid views and opinions. And it could be that they're somewhat aware of these flaws, but they're not willing to face them. And they somehow intentionally block their ability to work on these flaws, to work on these problems. If that's the case, that's actually severe suffering. That's actually a huge problem. And it can be difficult for a person in that situation to even look for help. They're not willing to invite someone into their mind to help them introspect. So if that's the case and you're listening to this, you probably think this is all nonsense anyway and doesn't apply to you. I hope that's not the case. And maybe we're not sure what stage we're in or to what degree we may need help. It can also be helpful to ask for feedback. We can also ask the people who know us well to give us feedback on their observations. What do they see about us that could be a problem? Where do they see that we could make some improvements? What do they think about the help we may need or the resources we could reach out to? Other people's observations can be very useful in helping us find the direction and helping us understand our condition and then knowing what method to make use of. So in conclusion, we all experience suffering to some degree. It could be a severe degree, could be moderate, could be minimal. None of us are completely and permanently ill or unwell. We're not permanently well or permanently healthy either. Illness and wellness are both impermanent and depend on the conditions we're facing and how we respond to them. Knowing what our condition is and how to respond to it, that's the key. So I hope this presentation was useful. I'd appreciate some feedback. If you have any ideas or thoughts, feel free to share them in the comments and let's have a compassionate conversation. <laughs>